Okay, good evening everybody. I'm Jay Rosen. I'm the director of the Studio 20 program and welcome to Open Studio Night. It's great to see so many of you here. Uh, this is when students graduating from our program present their work to family and friends and the journalism community of New York City. This is the fourth time we've done this uh, event and it gets better uh, every year. Our agenda is that eight of our graduating students who are lined up here will present their work for five to six minutes. And then Josh Benton of the Neiman Foundation, uh, who is here, Neiman Lab, will present his slideshow called The Year in Innovation in 2015. And then we'll have a few concluding remarks, and you're welcome to hang out with us afterwards and drink. <laughs> we are good at that. Uh, before we hear from our first presenter, Jasmine, a little about our program and a little about the students who you're going to be hearing from tonight. Studio 20 is focused on innovation in journalism. It's called a studio program because we make things. We don't just learn things, we make things. And we work with partners in the news industry, many of whom are represented here tonight, which we thank them for coming. The partners are the ones who supply us with really juicy problems that our students can sink their teeth into. The partners also uh, help our students understand what it takes to actually make change in journalism. As many of you know, I often describe Studio 20 as like a consulting group that gets paid in problems. Consulting group that gets paid in problems. And when you work in journalism, you are rich with problems because there are so many. In fact, that's become the name of our alumni group, Paid in Problems, PIP. One of our beliefs is that if you tackle a really big problem, a really important problem, that even if you make small progress, you've achieved something large. And you'll see what I mean when we get to our presentations. In the projects you're going to hear about tonight, uh, students get to test their ideas against hard conditions, the difficulty of making change in a fast-moving organization, and they learn what it takes to actually make a difference. So, without too much further ado, Jasmine is our first presenter, and she's going to let me know when she's ready. I'm ready. Our hashtag is Studio20 if you want to uh, discuss on social media. Jasmine, the floor is yours. This is it. The day that your first major story is launching at a national publication. You and your team spent six months researching, foying, interviewing, writing, and designing this story. But for all the time, money, and manpower you've put into this, how will you know if it was actually worth something? How will you know if your work had an effect on the world, either big or small? My project addresses these questions, and I call it the Quality Comment Tracker. The Quality Comment Tracker is a web tool that allows audience engagement editors to easily tag and track comments on their organization's Facebook page over time. It builds upon the idea that news organizations should understand how their work is impacting their audience so, they can, so that they can make informed decisions around the newsroom. I've partnered with the Marshall Project to create this tool. Part of the Marshall Project's mission is to amplify the conversation around America's criminal justice system. So it's critical that the company has a system in place to ta track the conversation happening around its work. Thanks to some great tools that already exist, news organizations are getting better at keeping track of more traditional, broad-level examples of impact. Those are things like someone getting fired after a piece debuts, winning an award, or a government changing a law. But they're still not so great at monitoring more subtle examples of impact. 
Understanding how people on an individual level are affected by journalistic work is an underserved area of impact measurement. So I started my project by thinking about how we could change this. Given the prevalence of social media use, we now have greater access to the thoughts and opinions of readers than ever before. They tweet their outrage to stories, tag their friends on interesting Facebook posts, and sometimes they even share personal stories or express how an article changed their opinion. Engagement editors, in particular, have the greatest insight into where the audience stands at any point in time. But, given the busy nature of their job, there's little time available to track individual comments. So, what if there was a way to do it that fit into their workflow? After working with Blair Hickman, the Marshall Project's audience editor, to understand the needs and constraints of those who work on audience engagement, I made a plan for an automated service that would find and highlight quality comments. The engagement editor would then only have to click to approve or dismiss suggested comments within a custom interface. Comments would be manually added to the system as well. But this quickly, quickly led me to my very first finding. Creating a multifaceted interface is time consuming and pretty inefficient. Instead, a foray into new impact measurement should start with something small that gets the job done and requires little effort from the engagement editor. So I revised my plan and instead designed and created a Google Chrome extension. Because this tool lives within the web browser where editors are already viewing Facebook comments, all of the work happens in one window. And that means this task uses very little time, it takes only 30 seconds to log a comment. So let's take a look at how the tool works. But first, imagine you're an engagement editor. You're reading the comments on your organization's Facebook page throughout the day. You come across one that you think is particularly good. In this example, a reader is sharing the contact information for officials related to this story in case other readers want to contact them. So you want to log this. To do that, you click the link to that comment and then the extension button in the URL bar. A window pops up with a replicated version of the Facebook post and the comment you selected. You click the comment you want to log and move forward. On the next page, you can add information about the comment. At least one tag for the type of impact or outcome is required. In this instance, the commenter is providing a resource for other readers. Other possible things to log include story topics, the story sources, and any additional notes that would be helpful for future review. When you submit, the information will be sent to a spreadsheet that you can sort and explore. This makes it easy to find trends to share with the rest of the newsroom. Then you carry on with your day, and it took you no time at all. If you want to bring subtle impact measurement to your newsroom, here are some things to keep in mind. First, before you do anything else, define your goals as an organization. Think about what type of impact matters to you. Do you want to see readers engaging in intelligent debate? Do you want to know that you've changed someone's mind? These goals will inform what you track. Next, create a system that fits into the current newsroom workflow. Impact measurement is important, but journalists are extremely busy. Start with a simple system that doesn't take journalists away from their regular routine. And finally, believe that everyone has a stake in this. Reporters, for example, can find potential sources and comments. Engagement editors can use data to make informed decisions about cultivating and harnessing the power of communities online. And for nonprofits in particular, funders can have a better sense of how their contributions are impacting the world. So to bring it all full circle, impact measurement should be an important part of every news operation. It's how we know whether or not our journalism is actually working. Now is the time to focus on how our, impact, how our work impacts the audience on an individual and subtle level. To do this, engagement editors need to be armed with a tool that allows them to track quality conversation quickly and efficiently. My project, the Quality Comment Tracker, is just that. And it helps turn all of this work into impact. I would like to thank Blair Hickman, Ivar Vong, and everyone at the Marshall Project, my loving family and friends, Jay, Zoe, and of course, my extremely talented Studio 20 classmates. Thank you.
I think you should know that Jasmine will be an uh, intern in the New York Times graphics department after this. So that tells you how successful she's been. <laughs> what I love about her project is that it's very common, because I've asked them, for people to say that they got into journalism to make a difference. But how much work have we really put into measuring the difference that journalism makes? Not that much. And that's the brilliance and ingenuity of Jasmine's project. Dimitri, are you ready? I am. The floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> Communication has changed. It's unlike it has been before on any point in history. New technologies to enhance human communication have changed our lives, from mobile phones to smartphones to social media. In the last few years, however, this process has been speeding up, and lately, messaging apps have been taking over as the prime method of communication. My project's goal is to see how journalistic companies can be effective at using these platforms to their advantage. My partner is Storiful. It's a video licensing company that specializes in finding user-generated content on the ongoing news stories and trends, acquiring the rights to use them, and provide it to other media organizations. Their focus on user-generated content makes understanding what to do with those platforms extremely important for them. For my research, I focused on WhatsApp, Yikiak, and Snapchat, and tested out if I could use them for Storiful's benefit. So let's start with Snapchat. Snapchat, um, it's a video messaging app that was originally popular among younger audience, but it's now gaining weight among other groups of people. We've set up Storyful Snapchat account. I figured out who the most prominent users of the platform and started observing them and following them. However, my observations showed that at this point, there is no clear potential in using the app for journalistic purposes, as most of the content that's being posted there has very low journalistic value. This situation, however, may change as the elections come closer, and now Storyful is fully equipped and ready to test it out. I also did a quick research into Yik Yak. It's a mobile app that lets users share content anonymously based on their geographic location. So my research confirmed my suspicions that it is mostly used among students on campuses. A good example of this would be the situation with the protests surrounding the shooting of Laquan McDonald in Chicago. So at first, when the protests just broke out, Yikiak was absolutely silent. But when one of the students at one of the local universities threatened to kill 16 people on another university campus, it has gone wild in a second. While Yikiak users don't really generate much visual content, like videos and images, it can still be a powerful tool to give context to the newsroom and should not be overlooked, especially in time when so many shootings are happening in schools and universities all across USA. So the mobile app I concentrated on the most was WhatsApp, due to its increasing use in the journalistic world and the fact that Storyful has been trying to get on it for a long time. As I found out, WhatsApp is mostly being used for quality user-generated content in Israel and the Middle East, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Burundi, Uganda, and Kenya. Most of these countries also have a solid number of WhatsApp journalistic communities that share content on a regular basis. So there are generally two ways to go from here. Way one is to reach out to those groups, get in, and try to salvage the content that they're sharing. However, as my project has shown, communities like this are extremely close to strangers for different reasons ranging from trust issues to language barriers to simple unwillingness to share exclusive material. So second way, <clears throat> is to make users themselves bring user-generated content to Storyful. I've picked up Storyful's WhatsApp account that was used on rare occasions and started inviting users from these countries to join us there by advertising our number through Facebook and Twitter, specifically targeting areas where major events were happening, like, for example, flooding in Yemen and Oman, and by personally going through Storyful's database of people that helped us create stories in the past and inviting them. So when people joined, we sorted them into groups and made some of them group admins, which in turn encouraged them to invite people they know by giving them a stake in the group's development. Compared to how Storyful's WhatsApp channel looked before, it is safe to say that Storyful has taken first serious steps in establishing itself on the platform. So to build on this, I propose Storyful follows four key suggestions. First and foremost, continue adding people and building out community and engage with it on a routine basis. Whenever a user shares content from an area where important events are happening, encourage them to add the company on WhatsApp. 
Even if the community fails to provide something worthy every day, they can still be useful for advice when following stories that are happening in their area. Second, Storyful, due to the nature of its work, is well known in journalistic communities, but not so among ordinary people. Therefore, it must increase its brand awareness. Let's look at an example. So, in the aftermath of the second Nepal earthquake that happened in May 2015, 70% of the content that was published on BBC's live blog was submitted by people in Nepal sharing videos and images. And they did so because they know what BBC is. And sadly, they probably don't know about Storyful. My third suggestion, if Storyful decides to penetrate those journalistic groups I was talking about before, it should hire journalists from the countries where this content is originating. It would be much easier for them to get in those communities because they won't have a language barrier and the communities would be much more open and trusting to them. And last and the most important point, provide incentives for users to share content. As for now, from a user's point of view, there is not much value for them just to come and share their content with Storyful. Whether this value is monetary or, or not, it's a crucial point to make Storyful's WhatsApp a working mechanism and not just a tool that's being used occasionally company needs to offer something to the users and make sure that the benefits are communicated to them properly. So this brings us to a global question. As we can see with this new merging apps, social media is becoming less and less public, whether it's private messaging or platforms for anonymous posting. What incentive we as journalists could give those people to open up and share their content with us? We know we have to come up with something because since times of Gutenberg and printing press, Progress in journalism has, has always been relying on new technology. And as I see it, whenever there's a new word in communication, we either find ways to extract value from it, or we might as well just lie down and die. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Dimitri. There's three points I want to make about Dimitri's presentation. One, did you notice when he was talking about college students, he snapped his fingers? Anyone catch that? That's Studio 20. <laughs> that snap. Secondly, he said that interaction online is becoming less and less public. That's a big problem for journalists, huge problem. And that's what I mean by even small progress on big problems can make a big difference. Finally, this year especially, we hear this phrase more and more that news organizations need to go where the people are. Go where the people are. What this means is, instead of expecting people to come to your site, to your home, to your place, you have to go where they're already interacting online. That's what go where the people are means. And Dimitri's project is an attempt to do that, to go where the people are. That's why it's so important. Jackie, are you ready? I am. Take it away. Can you imagine if every time something new happened in Syria, Wikipedia published a new Syria page? And in order to understand the bigger picture, you had to manually sift through hundreds of pages with overlapping information. Sound familiar? News companies do this every day. Much of the news overlaps itself, and it's inflexible and rigid. But people don't want to be talked at. They want to be talked with. Readers are bringing different amounts of knowledge to a story, and there should be a balance between the needs of new readers, casual consumers, and news junkies but there's a barrier to entry. So I ask, what if the constraints of the written article disappeared? I created Accordion, a prototype of a tool that can expand and collapse within a news article. The tool aims to create rich, detailed background information, and by doing so, it promotes a greater public understanding of current affairs and issues in an interactive and engaging format. My partner, The Wall Street Journal, has been an incredible laboratory for this because they do a lot of deep dives into complex, evolving stories, but they're also open to experimentation. For this project, I decided to start small, with one topic. I chose to look at the Theranos controversy. Over the past two years, the biotech startup began offering blood tests they claim required only a finger prick. The CEO, Elizabeth Holmes, 
claimed their new technology would revolutionize the blood testing industry. But in October, the Wall Street Journal published an investigation that found that the company's revolutionary claims were overblown. I went through the coverage and parsed out which bits of information were evergreen or repeated throughout articles. For a new user, this information is important, but often a quick paragraph with a gist isn't enough. But for users who have followed this story every step of the way, it's unnecessary. I created accordion as a fix to this problem. So let's take a look. Each accordion opens up to where additional content lives, like background, context, additional reporting, or journalist notes. With Accordion, there are also tools for sharing content. The news can have many different sounds, depending on how much you open it. This tool lets users into a kind of choose-your-own-adventure game, but for news. It's an interactive experience, but only if you want it to be. If a user is uncertain about names or past events, the information is there for them to explore. Also, since the information is right next to the article, it allows users to make connections that may not happen with the distance that exists between articles now. It balances the needs of all news consumers. And it's dynamic. It's what the web is there for. So let's take a closer look. I found that there are a few elements necessary for Accordion to be effective. Having a clear title shows the reader what they are getting once they click Open Accordion. Having short content gives readers quick value. They get in and out without having to leave the page of the article that they're on. If they want more information, there can be links to what will give them a clear roadmap of where to go next to explore. Having social tools allows readers to share the moments they have inside of Accordion. Some of the con content could contain these aha moments for readers, where something catches their interest and they want to share it. Having a clear break from the article into Accordion is important because it shouldn't take the reader away from the story. It should augment it. I discovered that there is even a business case for Accordion. Certain pieces could be branded content. Sponsored Accordions would have a different color, green in this case, so the readers will see right away that something is different. Once opened, there will be a note saying it is a sponsored post. This could be useful for technology news, where products are popping up in articles frequently, or in lifestyle news where products and services are often cited. For more complex or lengthy stories, accordion content could also be broken up by theme, such as people, places, events, or even reporter notes. Each theme would have a different color in order to organize the theme and set up the expectations for the readers. Accordion gives more value because it allows the reader to get the information they need without having to click a link and navigate away from the story they are reading or without having to go, and go, go to Google or Wikipedia to get the information that they're seeking. It also expands the web of a story by embedding background and context where it's most relevant. It has higher engagement because users are literally engaging with an article by expanding and collapsing the valves of accordion. Additionally, the content is shareable directly without users having to leave the page to tweet or post on Facebook. A huge bonus is that it provides more data for a newsroom by showing how much more time is spent on a page when this is available or how far down users read on an article with accordion. It also provides data about who is clicking on which valve, like subscribers versus not subscribers in the case of the Wall Street Journal or desktop and mobile for everyone else. Accordion can also provide valuable data about which accordions are getting clicked on, allowing editors to determine which pieces of information users are most interested in or curious about. For a journalist and an editor, a tool like this saves time by letting them embed background without having to look up what they've written before and rewrite it each time. News is not a one-size-fits-all product, and different experiences should be available to accommodate all types of readers. And with this, I say, we, as news people, should open ourselves up to the possibilities of changing the way people consume news. Because with Accordion, readers can choose their own news experience. Because news is not a destination. It's an adventure. I want to thank all of my people at the Wall Street Journal and NYU who helped me with this project, and to my friends and my family who have helped me with everything else. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie.
a couple of points I want to make about her presentation. One, I don't know if you caught this, she said, don't talk at, talk with. Very important point. Um, also, it used to be that business, technology, and editorial were separate divisions. We teach our students that these are all parts of the same problem. And Jackie's project shows that. She dealt with business possibilities where she mentioned the spon sponsor possibilities. Her whole project is, in a way, technology. And of course, it has to do with the news itself. Finally, and this is a problem that has been around for about eight or 10 years, the news system is much better at giving us the latest update than it is at giving us the background to the stories that are updated. And Jackie's project addresses that. That's one of the reasons that I like it so much. Claudia from Spain. Are you ready? Catalonia. <laughs> you ready? Ready, ready. Go. So imagine your readers having this reaction to a story. Oh my God! Yeah, look down! Look down! Look down! Oh my down. God! Down! Ah! <laughs> this was a roller coaster ride simulated by a computer. But what if the same the same thing could happen in journalism? Today, with cameras and rigs that allow that allow us to film in all directions and create 360 degree views. With huge platforms that allow these 360 degree videos to be uploaded and shared on the internet, with mobile apps that bring this virtual reality content directly to your phone, that then you can see in more accessible headsets and cheaper, virtual reality journalism is near than ever. We are at the same point as when cell phones like this started, started becoming popular. It's calculated that in two, from now to 2030, virtual reality will become mainstream. For my project, I partnered with Fusion. Fusion is the venture between Disney and Univision. One of the goals of Fusion is to experiment with technologies to prepare the two parent companies for the future. My project was to research how to use 360 degree cameras for the investigative unit at Fusion. This is the first 360 video we made. The US incarcerates children at a higher rate than any developed country on Earth. The majority are arrested for nonviolent offenses. As you can see, I'm able to explore the video by swiping the screen. This is because now we are seeing this 360 video from a projector and in a flat screen. But if later you want to try, you can get headsets over there and explore the video or other videos moving your head. The headsets are there, actually. Um, so we have two types of content in virtual reality. There are virtual environments that are created by computers or 360-degree videos that are real scenes filmed by a camera. This has a lot more history than the videos filmed with a camera. And because the content comes from a computer, it allows much more interaction. The other one, it's much more new. Just filmmakers and pioneers are starting to, to try this technology. And we can explore the video, but still we cannot interact. But these two fields are getting together. And we can see this when filmmakers start talking about volumetric filmmaking, which means that they are using cameras that can film depth, pixels with depth, and place people, place real people with depth inside virtual environments. So for example, this woman is a real woman, but the camera has filmed her with volume. For my project, I was I was one of the first three beta testers to try this software called CleanVR. CleanVR is a software that allows to create interactions inside 360 degree videos, like the one you're seeing on your screen. But more important, with this software, for example, I'm able to place the sound 
what I recorded. So for example, in the TV or the window. So when the person will explore the video, will acknowledge the changes in sound as she moves her head. So I guess after all this, we all agree that virtual reality is a new medium. The workflow to produce it is different. The ways users interact with the content is new. And little by little, we all acknowledge this change. We see this when, when Molly Swenson from Riot says this. Or when the creators of the displays, the virtual reality piece of the New York Times, acknowledge this change from hunting to setting up traps. Also myself, I have encountered many shifts and challenges when trying to do journalism with this technology. For example, this is one of the camera I was using. And from pointing the camera, we changed to be always in the shot. This led me to more complica complicated questions because we used to think the crew cannot appear in the shot. So if we are hiding there, how do we make questions to our characters? Maybe we're going from interviewing to agreeing to scenes. And what about light? How do we use light in 360 degree videos? Maybe we are going from frontal lightning to using spotlights as narratives to direct the, the view of our user. Because this audiovisual language is completely new and actually we have no idea. Because we are coming from a language that had frames and shots and close-ups to, to spherical compositions which we try that our users rotate in the direction that we wish or that we think it would be interesting. One thing is sure. Very soon we will be able to actually not tell stories but put people inside the stories. Meanwhile, 360-degree video and virtual environments get together, I would encourage you to begin testing low-cost cameras because the technology is changing very quickly and no one has really mastered it yet. So instead of waiting for the right moment to jump in, just start using these tools. The workflows are becoming more and more complex, so we have to understand other backgrounds and fields that we can now apply to journalists. And last, we are in the infancy of this new medium, and we have to learn all together the possibilities and complexities of it. I leave you now with a quote of the godmother of virtual reality journalists. She says, close your eyes and feel your body in the space. It has to do with where your body is in the space. See how bizarre, but inspiring, this quote becomes <laughs> in the context of journalism. For more findings and thoughts, you can check my website or follow me on Twitter. There is a very long list of thank yous. To summarize it, uh, all the people at Fusion, at CO20, uh, Clean VR, many conversations, my family and friends. Thank you very much. I'm so proud of Claudia because she took on a project where we don't even have the language to describe what she was doing. That's how far out there she was. And it's just inspiring to see somebody take on something where uh, we don't even know how to talk about it yet, but she's testing out these tools for uh, the purposes of journalism. And, Kasha, are you ready? I'm ready. Go. Newspaper editor Tess Flanders once famously said that a picture is worth a thousand words. How much, then, is a video worth? For news organizations, it's worth larger audience numbers. Over the past several years, news video has been steadily rising in popularity, and it's predicted to only continue to do so. Mobile has become a major vehicle for digital content like news video, in the past year, mobile has even outpaced desktop in audience numbers. It's now the main driver of growing audiences for digital publishers overall. 
For many of you, I'm sure this is a familiar sight. It's the constantly updating social media stream, a powerful channel where news outlets can serve content directly to their readers. The majority of mobile users are getting their news from the stream, and video looks great in it. It takes up more real estate than text does, so it catches the user's eye. Facebook and Twitter helps to help video stand out even more with their autoplay feature, which starts videos once they come within view. It's no surprise, then, that news organizations are straining limited resources and cramped budgets to try to produce video that's compelling and engaging for audiences. This is where my project, Press Play, comes in. Press Play is a report based on experiments done with my partner, The Daily Dot, to produce lightweight video for their audience and brand. The report, which will soon be available online, outlines what I found while working to produce original video products for The Daily Dot considering their restraints and the resources that were available. The Daily Dot is an online news site that reports on the internet as if it were a place. So it covers cybersecurity as well as the executives who are getting hired and fired at internet companies like Reddit. The Daily Dot made its name on coverage of esports or online gaming, but it continuously serves as a source of news for self-professed geeks and fandom followers. The Daily Dot is an excellent partner with which to experiment with video, because though their content and coverage lends itself well to a visual medium, the Daily Dot suffers from a low brand awareness overall. To succeed in video, news organizations' products have to stand apart from the rest. And that's even more true when a news organization's content is niche, as the Daily Dot's is. I've put a phrase on this slide that's helped me guide in my experimentation over the, several week, over the past several weeks. And it's very hard to say, but it's very important, so I'd like you all to say it with me. Niche news needs niche video. <laughs> Thank you. In other words, if a niche news organization wants to enter the video market, it needs niche video news content. And The Daily Dot understands this. They produce an, a video series out of Austin based around esports. It's definitely a niche, but it's a, but it's a narrow one. How many of us want to watch a stranger play through a new video game? The Daily Dot is succeeding in capturing this portion of its audience, but what about the rest? To reach broader audiences, newsmakers like The Daily Dot have to give them something a little, more, a little bit more recognizable. Bingeworthy was our first attempt at that. Bingeworthy is a weekly guide to the best streaming entertainment for cord cutters, fans, and geeks. It was designed to be easily produced and repeated and to repackage The Daily Dot's already existing content. Our first video, was a roundup of under-the-radar TV shows that are available for streaming on Netflix. Hey guys, it's Allie from The Daily Dot, and there is life after Orange is the New Black. Here are the 10 best shows on Netflix that you aren't watching yet. It's binge-worthy. Did that look simple and easy? It wasn't. <laughs> gotcha. Bingeworthy was supposed to be fast and easy to regularly produce, but writing, filming, and editing just one episode took many hours over the span of several days. And The Daily Dot just doesn't have that kind of time. Bingeworthy also requires headphones for viewing, so as a strategy, it's just not one that takes mobile into consideration. Mobile is a crucial component of news producers' plans, so I made sure that my next iteration, micro videos, took that into account. My main inspiration behind micro videos were these 15 second bumps or bumpers that appeared on Cartoon Network's late night adult swim programming. They're simple, but they're also very recognizable in style, and they have a sense of humor that's reflective of Adult Swim's branding. I wanted a similar effect with my micro videos, so here's what I came up with. Did that seem simple and easy? It was. Well, it was, it was easier. For one thing, it took a lot less time. Just a few hours for me to put this together myself. In another few hours, the Daily Dot's graphic designer drew up a new set of slides that were more consistent with their branding. I got the information from a Daily Dot article and used Creative Commons music and art to save time and money. And voila, our first micro video. By no means do I consider micro videos the sole response to the Daily Dot's video needs. But because they're easily reproducible, they are a great place to start. 
So to sum up, I'd like to leave you with two key takeaways when it comes to tackling video. The first, once again, is that niche news needs niche video. If your content is unique, as the Daily Dots is, it'll take some experimentation to find out what's possible and what works. And then secondly, when it comes to video, it's imperative that news organizations get creative to stand out. The best laid plans don't always work out the way they were envisioned, and embracing video into a newsroom's workflow means always being ready to try something new. I'd like to thank my partner, The Daily Dot, especially Matt Silverman and Allie Keeves, Zoe and Jay, my classmates, and my incredibly supportive friends and family. Thank you very much for your time. Key phrase from Kasha's presentation, she said, considering their constraints and the resources available. That's what we teach our students to do, is work within constraints and, and take account of the resources available. One of the key questions that news organizations are gonna be facing in the years ahead is how do we differentiate? How do we create something that's different than what everyone else is doing? And that's one of the things that I love about Kasha's project is that she went directly at that problem. Eric. Are you ready? Ready. Go. This is Sebastián Aullanet, engagement editor at El Observador in Montevideo, Uruguay. He wants his community to become news collaborators, not just consumers. But he feels alone. There aren't many editors in Uruguay doing actual engagement work, mostly just social media promotion. At an event, he meets Jennifer Brando, the founder of Harken, a platform that lets readers submit questions and votes, vote for topics which journalists then report on. Sebastian's team then becomes the first in Latin America to use the platform. Since they started, they have written four stories, three of which were the most read on the day they were published, like this one on the origin story of Montevideo's neighborhoods. Participatory journalism allows readers to become part of the news process, building buy-in and trust. They are no longer passive readers, instead they are an active community. It's not uncommon for engagement journalists to feel alone until they occasionally meet someone like the founder of Harken at an event. But what if they could meet more often and share experiences at a centralized space? This is why my project partner, ProPublica, launched the CrowdPower News Network to become the hub of community journalists and connect them with each other, like how members Sebastian and Jennifer did at the event. As Amanda Zamora, ProPublica senior engagement editor, explained, it is to create a more cohesive community where we can compare notes and encourage each other's work. My role has been figuring out what the members want and why, and thus designing alongside them what the spa space should look like and how it should function so they can engage with each other more effectively, building with, not for. After analyzing around 100 member application answers on what they want to get from the group, I came up with these user profiles. The coder, who wants to listen to members' needs, a legacy media engagement editor, who wants to learn about what other community engagers are doing, the local reporter, who wants to get examples of how others have done it and how to do it better, the academic who wants to share knowledge, and the community organizer who wants to connect constituent stories with news organizations. But the underlying need of most members is to get the help and inspiration they need for their own crowd-powered projects. Engaging with members one-on-one -on -one and through the Google, uh, the Google group forum, I was able to listen to their needs and how they interacted within the group. I learned that members were more likely to respond when they saw projects people in the community worked on, as well as when I highlighted their own work. Like this one where Al Jazeera America mashed up photos from photographers from Ferguson, Missouri, and Baltimore a year after the killings of Michael Brown and Freddie Gray. When a member asked for advice on a very specific problem, on a recent project she was working on, people responded and discussed the issue with her extensively. So people do engage when the ask is specific, or if they find value for themselves and their projects. They have expertise and are more than happy to share it. But time is an issue. It's a catch-22. While members want to learn about other projects to inspire their own work, their own work limits their ability to do so. 
Yet to do this, they need to participate in the space and ask questions. This is how they get ideas and learn from others. And the more they learn from others and get mentored within the space, the more engagement expertise they will get and be able to give back to the community. The idea is that the network is led by Propolica, but should be owned and managed by the community. Everyone in it has a lot of experience, but are busy. So how do you make them feel ownership of the space? What infrastructure do you build to let them connect and collaborate with each other more effectively? To do this, I built and coded a crowd-powered news database and user tested it with members reflecting different areas of the network. Sebastián was one of the users, so let's use him as an example. He explores pro project members have worked on to get inspired for his own work. He filters projects by topic and then by type of engagement. He's interested by the counter and how they collected data submitted by users on people killed by the police. And the project database all runs from a Google Sheet, so it's simple and easy to maintain. He then asks a question from the list of predefined questions, allowing managers of the site to see what questions and what projects members are most interested in. He now wants to submit an idea inspired by some of the projects he browsed and share it with the network so he can get some feedback from members and potential, potential collaboration opportunities. He volunteers to do a Q&A with a member who worked on the content project. This way, he has the chance to ask more in-depth questions for his own idea. He offers to help other members with his particular experience. The resp response then goes to a Google Sheet that only members will have access to. This opens another channel of direct communication between those who have experience they want to share and those who are new doing engagement work and need advice. My role at the Crowd Power News Network has been trying to create digital roads to connect members with what they need so they can build spaces for their own communities. With a platform, I've carved out channels of exploration and connection so they can more easily learn from each other. Hoping it becomes a hub for Crowd Power News projects that complements the discussions in the forum. I hope the foundations that I have helped lay for the space turn into a dynamic learning network of more community engagers, and that you will join them. If you want to join the network, visit the site here above. And thank you to all these amazing people that have the fortune to work with and be friends with. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. One of the great things about ProPublica, which has been one of our consistent partners, is that sharing what they have learned with other journalists and other newsrooms is a huge priority for them. And Eric's project totally participates in that, which is uh, wonderful. Also, I want to point out something he said in his presentation. I'm, I hope you noticed it. Building with, not for building something with people, not for them, is a super important principle that more and more digital journalists are learning the importance of, and Eric's project participates in that. Madeline, are you ready? I am ready. Okay, the floor is yours. We've already come a long way. From town criers delivering the news to waiting townspeople, to news available after only a short pause to let your modem dial up, to today, when as you're going about your day, every major news organization in the world can, if you let them, instantly push you the day's headlines. <phone rings> Ding. It's a push notification sent to your phone, the place where news organizations know they can most reliably reach you. Worldwide, current estimates put the mobile audience at 4.8 billion, with 2 billion on smartphones. When news organizations like Quartz talk about the next billion readers, they aren't talking about people on desktop. They're talking about readers on phones. We've seen this shift coming. In 2011, The Guardian said they got around 10% of their traffic from their mobile website. But this past year, the majority of news organizations, 39 out of the top 50, said that more of their traffic came from mobile than from desktop readers. This is a huge shift in the way we consume news, and new news organizations need to know how to react. Parsing the question of news strategy for mobile is exactly what my partner, Neiman Lab, was built to do. 
They pull apart the big questions in journalism today and report on the interesting and innovative strategies being tried in newsrooms around the world. The stakes involved in the shift to mobile mean that this question, how can newsrooms best react to the importance of mobile, now hold outsized prominence in Neiman Lab's mission to inform, educate, and prepare journalists. My project, Rallying the Mobile Majority, is a look at what happens when a subject-specific news organization realizes it has a mission-driven question that requires more attention than a tag or vertical could provide. Neiman Lab already has a vertical dedicated to mobile and apps, and you'll find a pretty robust group of stories tagged as mobile. But the shift to mobile changes everything, how stories are presented, delivered, and consumed. It's bigger than a tag or a vertical, especially for a site like Neiman Lab. So we started thinking about other ways we could build attention and community around news for mobile. We started by looking to other people asking themselves the same question. The Guardian Mobile Innovation Lab was launched in November and is housed at the Guardian's New York headquarters. Over the next two years, they'll perform a series of small experiments designed to test ideas and assumptions about how audiences receive and engage with news in mobile environments. We formed a content partnership. As they carry out their experiments, Neiman Lab will be there to cover it. And they'll share findings relevant to the industry, and Neiman Lab will broaden the distribution and reach of their work. Working together just makes sense. We're asking the same questions, and where the Guardian Mobile Innovation Lab brings the space and resources to carry out experiments, Neiman Lab brings the ability to provide additional context in our reporting on how and why their experiments are important. We launched this partnership a few weeks ago when I interviewed, when I published an interview with Sarah Schmalbach and Sasha Corin, the senior product manager and editor, respectively, on their plans for the lab. At Neiman Lab, we also started thinking about ways to quite literally bring people together to talk about mobile. On December 2nd, we hosted an event. If the space in the picture looks familiar, it's because it happened here. <laughs> Our topic was ad blocking. Ad blocking is an issue of particular concern to news organizations on mobile right now. You see, over the summer, Apple announced that its then unreleased iOS 9, the operating system for its iPhones, would for the first time allow ad blocking apps for sale in the App Store. News organizations care about this because they're trying to make money from these ads that Apple just now made it easier to block. While number, the number of readers using ad blockers is for now still small, there's definitely the potential for them to grow over the next few years particularly if news organizations don't react well. So we gathered a panel to talk about the issue. We had representatives from publishers, advertising, ad blocking, tech development, and academia. We offered 150 seats and we were full in less than 48 hours. What we were trying to do with this event was bring people who were all invested in what seems like a niche topic, but ultimately affects every level of the news business together. Ad blockers are of particular concern because of the potential threat they could pose to journalism's revenue streams if their adoption on mobile becomes widespread. It's one of the many unknowns news organizations are facing within this shift, and we're helping to address them, even to the point of getting people in the same room. That's what we're trying to do at Neiman Lab. For Neiman Lab, our big question is, how do you inform the news industry about what's up in mobile? But for your organization, you may have a fundamentally different question that's also critically important to you. Which brings me to my findings and an action plan I'd like to share. Here's how you build a sub-brand. You start with a name. We're calling our initiative Mobile Majority. Unfortunately, I can't claim credit for the name that came from Josh Benton, who you'll hear from later tonight. But getting a name helps, you, helps to give your new idea scope and guides you towards step two which is identifying who you're targeting. Neiman Lab's audience is large and dedicated. It's made up of news junkies, entrepreneurs, and innovators. But mobile, mobile also brings in an additional set of likely readers, developers, and those interested in problems posed by shifting audience platforms. We wanted to build something that also included them. Next, find partners with complementary interests. For us, that was the Guardian Mobile Innovation Lab. Lastly, to build a sub-brand, you need a community. There's a tendency to sentimentalize the word community. Sure, people who all read the same site share that experience, but to build a brand and loyalty to that brand, get people who maybe assume their particular problem is theirs alone, all in the same room. Once they have the realization that there are others, you've got something. We all understand the stakes involved in, moves, in mobile for news. It is the big question for news organizations right now. 
For Neiman Lab, whose mission is to inform on innovation, mobile majority is the response to scale for how important of a question news for mobile is. For other organizations, whatever their beat, should there be a similar moment of clarity when you sit up and say, wait, this question is bigger than just an article series or a tag or a vertical. These steps are a guide for how to build your sub-brand. Once you've identified the question, find your partners, build your community. I'd like to thank Jay and Zoe, Josh Benton and Neiman Lab, my NYU professors, and the Guardian Mobile Innovation Lab. Of course, my family, my friends, and my truly awesome Studio 20 classmates. There are four great eras in computing. The first was mainframes, then we had PCs, then we had internet, and now we have mobile. And what's great about Madeline's project is that she's delving deeply into that current and fourth era mobile computing. Also, I want to point out that when you finally see your female students with lipstick, they look totally different. <laughs> Sorry, Jay, I forgot mine. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Travis, are you ready? Yes, sir. Take it away. You're sitting at your desk, or you're in the shower, or standing shoulder to shoulder at the, at the Union Square subway station when genius strikes. The next big thing that's gonna save your company and usher journalism into the new digital future falls right into your lap. Wouldn't it be cool you think over and over as you scribble down each one of your brilliant ideas? When you present the idea to your team, wouldn't you believe it? Everyone in your department adds their own wouldn't it be cools to the conversation. After weeks or even months of careful design, development, and painstaking late night meetings, you finally launch your product and wait for the thunderous applause from your audience. But it never comes. The product flops. People scroll right past it and never engage. So what happened? Well, it sounds like your product suffered from a bad case of featureitis, or the unnecessary inclusion features no one wants, understands, or needs. <laughs> but your brilliant team, how could they have been so off base? What could you have done differently? User testing. For those of you who are unfamiliar, user testing is when you sit down real people, usually no more than five, either remotely or in person, and watch them navigate your site while you take notes and ask questions like, what do you think happens when you click this button? User testing can help you understand why your readers aren't interacting with this fancy new feature you just spent months putting together. It can tell you if people find the colors abrasive or off-putting, or whether they even understand what your product does in the first place. So how can a small to medium-sized media organization with an imperative to innovate make user testing a regular strength of their development cycle? Well, the utility of user testing in journalism has not always been clear. Journalists used to associate user testing with marketing, and due to the wall between business and editorial, it was often seen as a business side takeover of the newsroom. That wall has broken down over time, and today we're now flooded with tons of data that tells us how our readers interact with our site. But that doesn't mean we understand the users as human beings. That's where user testing comes in. For my project, I partnered with The New Republic a publication which is no stranger to the fight between the old guard and the new. As some of you may remember, a year ago, two-thirds of the masthead resigned in protest as the new owner began to transform the New Republic into a digital-first publication. While the media world lamented the fall of this once great magazine, the people who stuck around got busy trying to figure out how to bring the publication into the 21st century. And they began by designing products they hoped their, their users would love. And what better way to do that than user testing? The first product we tested is called Minutes. Despite being a traditionally long-form publication, the New Republic wanted a way to offer their readers engaging quick take updates on current events throughout the day. Through user testing, the New Republic learned that a lot of their ideas about Minutes were accurate. We learned that readers understood the purpose of Minutes and found the content interesting and provocative. Users found the chronology of posts clear, and they liked the personal touch of the author photos. We also tested a new feature called Signal. Signal is a shareable feature on every article page that articulates an author's argument. And through user testing, we learned that people understood Signal's purpose. However, the sharing call to action was unclear. 
there were share buttons, but they were tucked away all the way in the corner. And users didn't click them because they weren't sure what would happen if they did. Based off the feedback from user tests, we tweaked the design of Signal, making the call to action clear. We also added the word share the to Signal and moved the share buttons closer to the call to action. In the course of my project, I found what I believe are some good guiding principles to help bring user testing to any similarly sized media company with an eye on innovation. My first guiding principle is that you can user test at any time, but you should know the different benefits of testing at different stages of development. There are at least three useful places where you can implement user testing. You can start user testing early in the design process to save your organization from sinking precious resources into a product your users will find unusable. You can also use a test right before a product launches to find any last minute usability awkwardness before the world sees it. Finally, you can use a test right after launch like we did, which will provide helpful feedback to inform the next iteration of the product. Knowing when the right time for you to test your product is important, which is why someone needs to own user testing. Because every company's resources and product development priorities are different, someone with intimate knowledge of the product development cycle needs to lead the charge. Now, one of the best applications of user testing is when you have a room full of people with different creative ideas of what a product should look like. This would probably sound familiar for the journalism people in here. In this scenario, it's usually the hippo that gets its way. Instead of debating... <laughs> look familiar? <laughs> Instead of debating the various wouldn't it be cool ideas, this would be the perfect opportunity to resolve disputes by having everyone create a mock-up of their design and put it in front of some users. This brings me to my last point, how to get your organization to buy into user testing. In the age of social media, user feedback is ubiquitous and often inflammatory. Imagine if the only customer feedback you ever heard was from people yelling at you through social media. Understandably, journalists are a little skeptical that users can inform the design process. I invited members of the New Republic editorial and product teams into our user testing sessions and everyone who sat in on a session said they would recommend it to their coworkers. If there's one thing I learned from this project, it's this point. The importance of institutional buy-in simply cannot be overstated. Without support across departments and from up top, your brilliant user insights will fall on deaf ears. Including coworkers from across departments will demonstrate the value of user testing by reminding everyone that everything we do is ultimately for the user. In my research and application of user testing principles, I found that there's no one-size-fits-all solution, but what I can offer you is the next few steps. Take a look at your data and find out which of your products are underperforming. Talk to your team and try to convince them that for a very minimal cost, you'll provide them with really useful user feedback that just may be able to help you understand why your product is failing. Because if your product team is stuck creating solutions in search of problems, if wouldn't it be cool are the last words of your product development cycle, they may just be the last words of your publication. <laughs> Thank you. We're going to get Josh Benton ready. And I hope you noticed that um, one of the things Travis observed was editorial people of the New Republic had never really experienced user testing before, but he introduced them to it, and they saw how valuable it could be. That's part of what Studio 20 is about. User testing, design thinking, human-centered design, these are things that are massively important in journalism, and that's part of what Travis introduced in his project, which is why it's such a great project. Before you guys. Sorry. We just wanted to interrupt and um, thank Jay and Zoe for all of their help and all the work that they've helped us do and that they've, that they've done with us. Um, oh, that's so good. Good. Yeah, okay.